morning. Something like this. Lord God, so far today I've done all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been greedy or grumpy or nasty or selfish or overindulgent. I haven't cut anyone off in traffic. Smiled at people. I've been relatively nice to most people. I'm really glad about that, Lord, but in a few minutes, I'm going to get out of bed and start my day. <laughs> and from then on, I'm probably going to need a lot more help. You ever feel like that? Yeah. <laughs> I feel pretty good so far. I haven't done a lot of sitting, but pretty soon my feet are going to hit this floor. And all hell is going to break loose. <laughs> There's no warm water in the shower, and people are, and my breakfast is not ready, and we run out of pop tarts, and people are driving slow in the left lane. Lord, I'm going to need a lot more help today. Pray. Pray for one another. We've been in a sermon series for the last several weeks on the one another's in the Bible. And there's, there's plenty more, but this is uh, the conclusion of our series today. We, we started this off two months ago with love one another. Love one another. We've demonstrated to you how when God's love pours into us and it is manifest, it, is, it comes out in an expression of love for each other. There is an expression of love that we share with each other in the church and fellow believers in Christ and even the ones that are outside the fellowship, even the ones that we would even deem that would be our enemies. So we learned that as love pours in, service pours out, we should serve one another because we love one another. We should bear one another's burdens because of the love that we have for one another. We talk about encouraging one another. When the love of God and the love of Christ is compelling you and is pouring into you, out of that comes a willingness and a desire to encourage each other. In the encouragement, sometimes we need to admonish one another. To love them so much, to point out to them areas of their life that are falling short of the commands of Scripture. Love. Bear. Serve. Encourage. Admonish. Today, we come to the concluding message in this series that would be pray for one another. Pray for one another. I'll, I'll probably say it more than once today, but this may be the most loving thing that you could ever do for someone else. It's to stand in the gap for them. To bow on your knees before the Father and lift someone else up in prayer. You could help them out of a financial jam. You could come alongside in a difficult and dark time. You could see them at the hospital and visit them. You could see them in prison and visit them. You could feed them a meal. You could share your clothes with them, your material possessions. You could let them borrow your car for a time when their car is messed up. You can do a lot of things for people in service and love and encouragement. But I don't know that there's any greater expression of love than to lay down yourself and to lift someone else up to the Father. I read this week, I uh, was looking at some different passages of Scripture and, and um, it just was asking the question, what is prayer? And I looked through several of them, and uh, Andrew Murray had a quote in his book. He says that prayer is the very pulse of the spiritual life. The very pulse of the spiritual life. If you were to walk outside and you were to see someone broken and bleeding and unconscious laying on the sidewalk or laying on the side of the road, one of the first things that you would do is what? You take your fingers and you put them up to the neck and put them up to the wrist. What are you checking for? Checking for a pulse. What does that pulse indicate? Heart. What does that heart pumping indicate? Life. You're checking for pulse. You're checking for a heartbeat. You're checking that the blood of life is still <coughs> surging through those veins and is bringing life to its members. And I wondered, at, as I read that quote, I wondered if there's ever a time that we would 
see a brother and sister in Christ broken and wounded and hurting and unconscious in their spiritual walk, will we feel compelled and loving enough to come alongside and put our fingers up to their spiritual body and see if there's a pulse of life flowing through them? Prayer is that pulse. A relationship with God through prayer is one of the most important things that we'll ever do. I want to ask you to turn your Bibles today to the book of James. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to the book of James. It's in the tail end of the, of the New Testament. You can probably find it quicker if you're unfamiliar with Scripture. To go to the back of your Bible in Revelation and hang left and keep going back and you'll find it. If you came in today and you do not have a copy of God's Word, let me share one with you. Uh, I'll get one to you right here. Larry's got some in the back. If you're in this section over here, raise your hand. Dave, or Wade, you got some right here, Wade. Oh, yeah, back there, I've got one over here. Let me make sure everybody sees this. Anybody else? Get Dave up there a little. Anybody else need one? I want you to see this today. This is not a passage that I'm going to teach. It's a foundation piece that we're going to start on today, just as a point of reference. In James chapter 5, this is the half-brother of Jesus writing instructions to the church, practical instructions to the church of how to be engaged with God and how, how to live a Christian life, how to be godly in a very ungodly world. All right? So in James 5, he's concluding this letter to everyone who's been persecuted and scattered. And he says, hang on. And he asks a series of questions and then he answers them with what they should do. In James chapter 5, verse 13 is where we'll pick it up. If you'd stay with me, please. Let's just read a few verses here. And then we'll get straight into the message. James chapter 5, verse 13. He asked the question, is anyone among you suffering? What must he do, church? Pray. Is anyone cheerful? What should he do? Sing. Sing, sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church. And what are they supposed to do? Pray. pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Look at that last verse. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Somebody with a different translation, read that last sentence to me. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Someone else, different translation. The effective prayer of a righteous man availeth much. There's King James in the front row right there. The fervent <laughs> prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Someone else. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is for has great power as it is working. The prayer of who? Pretty consistent across the board on those translations, huh? The prayer of a righteous man. It's as if God is listening to one type of prayer and not listening to another type of prayer. We're going to go on at the end of the message today and say that the prayer of the righteous man availeth much or is powerful and effective. The prayer of the self-righteous man has no power. And it's very ineffective. Let's pray today. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to share your word. May your word bring us enlightenment to our souls, instruction to our minds, encouragement to our hearts today. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Again, uh, uh, my intention is not to teach James 5. I, I wanted to use it as a reference point to kick kick things off today. We'll be examining several pieces of scripture as we go through the message today. But prayer as defined is the very pulse of a spiritual life. Most people would define prayer as communication. It's an opportunity to communicate with God. And it is true. It is communication. Most people treat prayer, this type of communication, as more of a monologue. What is a monologue? How many people are talking in a monologue? One. One. That is right. What is a dialogue? How many people are talking in a dialogue? Two or more than one. That's right. There's conversation that's happening. What does it take for good conversation to happen? One has to speak. The other has to. Yes. Then you give the other one a chance to speak in the other one. There you go. That's 
communication. Communication is maybe the core value of any relationship. We have love, yes, we have acceptance, yes, we have, we have several things, but communication is the way we express this love. But I will tell you today that I think communication is the number one weapon that we use against each other when we're angry at each other. While it is a core value of human nature to want to communicate with the people that we love, it is also human nature when we've been affected by someone to withhold communication or to use communication in a very negative way. As we think about today communicating with God, we must think of it as a dialogue. We must think of it as an opportunity to share with God, but also an opportunity to listen to God. This is how we define it today. Your first fill in the blanks of your summer notes are this. God speaks in His Word. As He speaks, He reveals Himself, His power, His nature, His character, His activity in the world. But God speaks in His Word. Many people would like to say, I don't know what His voice sounds like. I, I don't know what I'm supposed to be listening to. If I listen really quiet, I get distracted because then I hear crickets chirping and I hear music in the background. I hear the neighbor kid next door with the bass thumping. I hear all kinds of stuff when I try to get quiet and hear an audible voice. But we're not always talking about an audible voice, are we? God speaks in His Word. Please, when you try to pray and you try to listen to God, do it with this open. I've said many times before, turn this mic up for me back here a little bit. You want to hear the voice of God and what it sounds like? This is what it sounds like, y'all. Amen. Amen. That's what the voice of God sounds like. He reveals Himself, His purpose, His nature, His character, His activity, everything that you could possibly want to know. He's written it down in a book. And when you pray with an open Bible, be ready. He'll speak to you. But you'll say, man, the last time I opened up my Bible, I put my finger down, and there was Zerubbabel and Nebuchadnezzar and, and Nahim, Lohamai, and all these that kind of play, people in place. I don't understand that. Guess what? You haven't tried hard enough. You haven't practiced enough. Because even those hard to name places are important. Even those really weird names and things like that in the Bible. Guess what? Their weird name is in the Bible and yours is not. <laughs> Something important happened in those places and with those individuals. We talked about this in our foundations class the other night. Chris is not mentioned in the Bible. But Zerubbabel is. Gary Gunn, where's Gary Jr. Gary Gunn, Gary Gunn, Gary's not mentioned in Scripture. But Nebuchadnezzar is. Then we came around and Paul's name was mentioned in the Bible. <laughs> he got all puffed up full of himself. He was more special. <laughs> God speaks in His Word. God reveals Himself in, in, in really incredible ways in, in nature and, and in what, what, the things that we see and we experience, but there's nothing like just spending time here and finding here. That's where He speaks. And then when He does, what do we do? We hear and we respond in prayer. We hear and we respond in prayer. This quote from my systematic theology book this week said this, prayer is not made so that God can find out what we need. God wants us to pray because prayer expresses our trust in God and is a means whereby our trust in Him can increase. God doesn't need you to voice it out loud so He can know what you want to need. He already sees that and He already knows that. He knows your thoughts. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what your heart is feeling. He knows exactly the things that you want. You don't have to write out a list for Him like you do Santa. You just don't. He already sees it and He knows it and He has already decided what He wants to do for you long before you ever name it. But if there's something special about when you bow in reverence before Him and you humble yourself before Him and whether it's out loud or whether it's inside, you humble yourself enough to begin to pray. It deepens your love. It deepens your trust. Your fellowship with Him gets deeper and deeper and deeper. You begin to learn that, you, that God wants to use you as a partner in the kingdom of God. Could He snap His fingers? Could He whistle? Could He breathe? Could He think it and it come into existence? Absolutely. But He desires to use you. You crazy old weirdos. He wants to use you and me. I don't know why. I look at myself in the mirror and go, what 
could he possibly want from me? And then he shows me. Prayer is not made so that God can find out what we need. It's a way to deepen our trust in Him, in our love and our affection for Him. Prayer acknowledges that our need is not just a little boost from God, and then we can handle it on our own from here. Prayer says, my need is total. I come before you, God, and I admit, and I confess I am nothing without you. Lord God of heaven and of the universe, would you bow and hear my prayer today? My need for you is total. There's three truths about prayer. There's lots of truths about prayer, but there's three that I'm going to point out quickly to you here today. The first one is this. Why pray? Because we're commanded to pray. The first truth about prayer today is that we are commanded to pray. In 1 Thessalonians, we, we hear these three short little words. This is one verse in the Bible that you can easily memorize. Anybody can. It says, pray without ceasing. I'm not excluding anything before that. I'm not excluding anything after that. There's three words in this verse. Say it with me. Pray without ceasing. Marsha, take that slide back there for me. One slide before that. Okay? Just pick one. What does that verse say? Pray without ceasing. What does it say? Pray without ceasing. Now you can take this back. See, you've already memorized the verse of Scripture today. How about that? What's it mean? Without ceasing. Surely it doesn't mean I'm supposed to walk around like this all the time with my eyes closed, my head down. Man, that's a headache waiting to happen, isn't it? That's a major pileup on I-65 waiting to happen, isn't it? Yes. It would be really awkward for the quarterback to go out and throw a pass and all of a sudden right in the middle of the receiver goes down and begins to pray. Praying without ceasing is an attitude. Praying without ceasing is a lifestyle. Praying without ceasing is, it means constant fellowship with God that wherever you are, whatever you're involved in, you can pray. And, and as we define this, this communication with God, just as you would be in communication with any loved ones that you would have, there's going to be opportunities for you to do this. Okay? Just like if you're, if you're married and, and, and you're in love with each other and, and uh, throughout the day you're going to make a call, you're going to check up on each other, you may send a text to say, hey, can you pick up some bread and milk on the way home? Yes, dear, I sure will. You know, you, you have an opportunity to communicate throughout the day. You're thinking about them, and so you respond to them. And the same is with God, wherever you find yourself. You don't use any special words. You don't have to be a special time, there's no special posture. Pray without ceasing says, wherever you are, whatever you're in the middle of, whatever you're doing, you can pray. I've prayed on the golf course before. I've prayed in the mall before. God, please get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I've prayed in the hospital before. I've prayed at funeral homes before. I've prayed at weddings before. I've prayed in a lot of different places. Pray in my car. Pray in my office. I pray in the lobby, just like I pray in my office. Pray without ceasing. Where do you go when you leave this place today? That doesn't mean that you don't have to pray again until next week. And wait for Sunday to come in here and have someone lead you in prayer. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said we should begin to pray before we kneel down, and we should not cease when we rise up. Pray without ceasing. Paul told the church at Colossae to devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. An attitude of thanksgiving. Any time that you are coming into the presence of God, there should be an attitude of thanksgiving, church. Especially an attitude of thanksgiving. Because being in the audience of God and demanding anything is not a good idea. There's a little helpful tip for you today. Number two, we're expected to pray. Number one, we're commanded to pray. Number two is we're, there's an expectation that we're going to pray. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. As we are being in constant fellowship with God, praying without ceasing, we got to understand that there's evidence of, of, of Scripture all throughout the, the whole of Scripture when, when people are in have an encounter with God, that they're changed. And because of that change, one of the things that they're going to do is seek to be in right fellowship with God. And they're going to pray, and they're going to praise, and they're going to worship, and they're going to, to be thankful. And, and this is just a part of our relationship with God. 
In verse 2 of chapter 6, notice that the first two or three things are talking about giving. But if you'd like to, if you'd like to write in your Bible, you've got your pen handy, circle the word when. There's an expectation that you're going to find in the scripture. Verse 2, so when you give to the poor, he says, do not sound a trumpet before you, the hypocrites do in the synagogue. In verse 3, he says, but when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. There's an expectation that you're going to give because you know Christ, because Christ is in you, His love is in you. Part of the manifestation of that love is that you're going to give. It doesn't say if, it doesn't say hopefully, it says when you give to the poor. There's an expectation that you're going to give. So look at verse 5. When you pray, not if you pray or if you can get around to it or hopefully you will or someday you might consider. There's an expectation because we belong to Him. We're disciples of Christ. There's an expectation that prayer is going to happen. When you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. Verse 6, but when you pray, Go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Speaking of this secret place, how many of you have gone to see the movie War Room yet? You see, raise your hand. Yeah. Powerful. Powerful movie. How many of you have gone home and cleaned out a closet yet? Anybody? What? None of you did. You went, what a powerful movie. You cried, you laughed, you left the movie going, that's what we got to do, church. We got to get in our closet. And you haven't cleaned out a closet yet? I haven't. <laughs> There's a secret place. A place where you and God meet together. It may be one place all the time. There may be several places. If you're a busy person, you get 30 minutes for lunch. Maybe that's a place that just for 30 minutes... You get to eat your sandwich, you get a bag of chips, and your Kool-Aid, and you sit under a shade tree, or you go into a mop closet at work, or you go outside and sit in your car for a little bit, whatever the situation may be, and just spend a little time with your bologna sandwich in the Lord. Go into the secret place. He said, don't be like the hypocrites coming in and just praying for all to see. What good is that? He says, their reward is in full. If that's what you want. You want people to think you're super spiritual. You want people to think that you're a powerful prayer. You want to come and, and do it in public and things like that. But there's something that has to take place. There's an expectation of intimacy and closeness that the Lord desires in prayer. When you pray. Paul told the church in, in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 6. He says, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. All believers, along with the prophets and kings of the Old Testament, the songwriters of the Bible, the disciples, even Jesus himself, praying, humbling themselves, and bowing before the Father. Number one is commanded to pray. Number two is expected to pray. Number three is God values and desires our prayers. If you've never seen the scripture before in Revelation, it talks about before the throne of God in heaven, there are bowls of incense. And the Bible goes on to define what's in those bowls of incense. It's the prayer of the saints. The prayers of the saints being offered are sweet aroma to God. He values your prayers and puts them in bowls and rejoices over them. And this is sweet smelling incense to him. God values and desires our prayers. There's a practice of prayer, though, that, that, we, that we struggle with sometimes because I don't know the right words to say. I don't have a good closet to clean out. I don't know where to put my stuff. I don't know what to do. I, I don't know if I should bow or if I should stand or how I should hold my hands or, or the right vocabulary to use. Man, I, I'm just not very good at it. And so the practice of prayer becomes stagnant just because we don't think we're very good at it and never no place in the Bible do I ever see a place where it says you've got to use the right words in Scripture. Don't get caught up in the Matthew 6, Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is not there for you to say over and over and over again. The Lord's Prayer is to say, pray like this. 
Acknowledging God for who He is. Requesting and making petition for your daily needs. Confession of sin and receiving forgiveness of sin. Attributing to God all that is His. These are the kind of things that the Lord's Prayer models for us. It's not that you just have to, if you want to say that prayer, say that prayer. If you want to say those words, say those words. But don't neglect to cry out with your heart before Him. Say, God, I'm struggling. You know you can tell Him that? And you know you can tell Him that? God, I'm struggling. I need you. But because we don't have the right words, we're not very good at it. We just don't. We just, we don't pray at all. We'll have a few words because we're supposed to pray for a meal. We won't necessarily pray for a job change or who we're going to get married to or, or anything else like that. We'll pray for that burrito we're going to eat. <laughs> Some important things in life we let go by without praying. Prayer is not an option for the believer. Prayer is not an option for the believer. Prayerlessness is sin against God. And you need to see this today. Prayerlessness is sin against God. You don't know the right words to say, so you don't pray. It's an excuse and it's sin. You don't know the right thing to do or the right place to do, or you, you just haven't got a chance to clean out your closet yet, or, or you haven't really found the right place yet, so you're not praying because you haven't found the right location yet. It's an excuse and it's a sin against God. It's also an extreme act of arrogance to say before your Creator, I have no need for you. I read this quote from the first service today. Our foundations class is getting ready to go through this in a couple of weeks in, in book six. But many Christians have the same attitude toward prayer that they do toward spinach. Both are good for you. They'll recognize that, but they must be endured and not enjoyed. I can relate to that. On the spinach front. Yeah. People do the same thing, but they're all about praising. Man, they're all about getting their worship on. They're all about the music and, and praise and worship. And they're all about, you know, some denominations are still really into the, lots of the sign gifts and, and things of that nature. And, and the, the sensationalism of the event of. The Sunday service and our gathering times together. But prayer. <coughs> Prayers. Spiritual spinach. No fun. Takes time. Not good at it. <laughs> then you've never really prayed. You've never been alone with God and, and allowed Him to just show Himself to you. More could be said than another one. The model for prayer, there's lots of, the Lord's Prayer is a model for prayer. There's lots of things that we can see in Scripture in ways that we can pray. One of the most popular that we've seen uh, in, in the later years, in the latter part of the 20th century, was, was this acrostic, ACTS, A-C-T-S. As you fill in your blanks today, here's your answers. A stands for adoration. C is confession. D, uh, D. T is thanksgiving and S is supplication. Adoration is an opportunity for you to come in prayer and to praise God and to worship God for who He is and for what He's done. It's an opportunity to boast to the Lord and to applaud in front of Him of how great a job that He's done. Tell me, those of you that have been to Grand Canyon and you see this beautiful sunset across that desert and that Grand Canyon that you didn't want to bow and just... Thank God for His creativity. For those of you that have ever been to the mountains, maybe if you've been to the Smoky Mountains and, and you get up early in the morning in Gatlinburg and you see the mist kind of over the, the mountains and the sun popping up over the top of them. Beautiful. If you've been to the ocean, as far as the eye can see, and the waves come and the waves go, and the waves come and the waves go, do you know why they do that? Because that's where God tells them to stop. Amen. That kind of God is who we're praying to. Tonight, there's going to be a huge blood moon tonight. It'll be the last chance some of you will get to see it. It's like 2030-something is the next time it's going to be coming around. You're going to get to see that tonight. 
incredible. We praise Him. We worship Him for who He is, the Sovereign Lord, Creator of all things, care and caretaker and keeper of my soul. We also, in light of an acknowledgement of who He is, we see how little, how sinful, and how dirty we are. <laughs> so we confess. The prayer must be must consist of confession. It's an acknowledgement of our sin and His Lordship. T is thanksgiving. In everything, give thanks. I, I read this little story this week I, <clears throat> I want to share with you. A four-year-old boy who was asked to return thanks before Christmas dinner. He was praying, and, and the family members bowed their heads in expectation. And he began his prayer thanking God for all of his friends, naming them one by one. He thanked God for Mommy and Daddy and Brother and Sister and Grandma and Grandpa and all his aunts and uncles and cousins. Then he began to thank God for the food. And this little four-year-old boy was very thorough. He thanked God for the turkey, the dressing, the fruit salad, the cranberry sauce, the pies, the cakes, and even the cool whip. But then he paused. Everyone waited. They waited some more. After a long silence, the young fellow looked up at his mother and whispered, if I thank God for the broccoli, won't he know that I'm lying to him? <laughs> Such an honesty and a sincerity in a heart like that. Well, you know I'm lying? Yeah, he kind of will. It says that everything gives thanks. Not for everything, in everything. There's going to be some hardships in your life that you're going to hard to be thankful for. A loss of a loved one, a loss of a job, a, a something that's gone on, you know, something that's fallen apart in, in your house and, and you got to get it fixed. Or things like that. It's hard to be thankful for things like that, right? But he's not asking you to be thankful that your washer and dryer went out. He's saying, in everything, give thanks. Yeah. You can give thanks when your washer and dryer goes out and your car breaks down. Why? I can give thanks because he's taking care of me. Yeah. And guess what? Don lives down the street from me. And she's got a washer and dryer at work. Amen. I'm going down there. My car's broken down. But guess what? Billy's about there. He'll let me use his car. The money gets fixed. God takes care of me. He takes in all circumstances. The fourth, the, the S is the supplication. And there's two parts of supplication. There's petition and there's intercession. Petition is the request that we have for ourselves, the, the request that we're laying out before the Lord. And then intercession is the opportunity to pray for each other. That's what I want to talk to you about next. Interceding for someone else and lifting up of someone else, not necessarily caring for your own concerns and your own needs and your own desires, but, but lifting someone else up to the Father. Denying yourself and your own wants and your own list and lifting someone else up, praying for someone else. This is the conclusion of our series, Pray for One Another. We've often heard the words, be careful what you pray for, right? Be careful what you pray for because sometimes you may be in opposition with God. You may be in total agreement with God and He's getting ready to, to, to show up in a way that you may be not fully expected. Listen to this story. Johnny, a very bright five-year-old boy, told his dad he'd like to have a baby brother. And along with his request, he offered to do whatever he could do to help. So his dad, being very bright himself, paused for a moment and replied, I'll tell you what, Johnny, if you pray every day for two months for a baby brother, I guarantee that God will give you one. Well, Johnny responded eagerly to his dad's challenge and went to his bedroom early that night to start praying for his baby brother. He prayed every night for a whole month. Nothing happened. After that time, he began to get skeptical. He checked around the neighborhood and found out that what he thought was going to happen had never occurred in the history of the neighborhood. You just don't pray for two months and then whammo, a new baby brother. It just doesn't happen. So Johnny quit praying. After another month, Johnny's mother went to the hospital. When she came back home, Johnny's parents called him into the bedroom. He cautiously walked into the bedroom, not expecting to find anything, and there was a little bundle lying right next to his mother. His dad pulled the blanket back, and there was not one baby brother. Not two baby brothers. But three baby brothers lying next to the mother. 
Johnny's dad looked down at him and said, Now, aren't you glad you prayed? But Johnny hesitated a little bit and looked up at his dad and said, Yes, but aren't you glad I quit when I did? <laughs>
True intercessory prayer seeks not only to know God's will and see it fulfilled, but to see it fulfilled whether or not it benefits us and regardless of what it costs us. The Holy Spirit prays for you. Jesus himself stands at the right hand of God and prays for you, interceding for you. Not so you'll just get all the presents that you want, but to bring glory to the Father. We said at the beginning of the day, the ineffective or the, the effective prayer of the righteous man availeth much or accomplishes much or is powerful and effective. Yet the ineffective prayer of the self-righteous man has no power and no effect and accomplishes little. I want to point out some things here to you today. Let me just give you the stuff that will fill in the blanks because I want you to take this home with you. There are things that hinder our prayer. How can we have an effective prayer life if God's not listening to us? You ever felt like that before, that you're praying and you're praying and you're praying, but it's not even clearing the ceiling? And God's not listening? You're not getting what you want? Here's some reasons. Your prayers can be hindered because you have selfish motives. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, it says in James, so that you may spend it on your pleasure. It is not the glory of God that you seek. It is your own pleasure. And therefore, you have selfish motives and God does not hear that prayer. Number two is unconfessed sin. The Bible says the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. He says your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Your sin, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. You really expect God to honor you with His power and His presence when you are, you've offended Him and broken His law and you refuse to admit it? Come on. He's not listening. The psalmist says, If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Number three is the life lived to the flesh. The scripture says, The mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. The mind set on the flesh on the flesh of man, on your own cravings and your own desires and your own lusts is hostile towards God. And he goes on to say, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. He's not listening to your prayer. You are not pleasing Him. You've offended Him. You've broken His law. And you set yourself up as a hostile enemy towards God. He's not listening to that prayer. Number four, numbers 4 through 8 have everything to do with the heart. Disunity in the home is one. Between husband and wife, in your margin, you could write out there a divided heart. Disunity in the home is a divided heart. Number five is a hard heart toward others. First John 3 and 1 John 4 says, how can you say you love God and have hatred in your heart for your brother? How can you possibly say you love God and see your brother in need and ignore him? God's not listening to that prayer. Number six is an anxious spirit. We call this a crowded heart. A crowded heart. The worries, the concerns, the fears of this world cripple your faith. The Bible says be anxious for nothing. Number seven is unforgiveness. We call this a bitter heart. God's not listening to the prayer. A bitter heart. What does he say to do? He says, if you're coming to give your offering to me, if you're coming into worship with me, and you find that there is a brother that you have offended or a, a, an offense that a brother has against you, what does it say? Keep on sinning, church? It says, leave your gift at the altar and go make it right with that brother. Unforgiveness and bitterness in your heart, God does not hear. And number eight, doubt or an unbelieving heart doubt or an unbelieving heart. The scripture says, if you, any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith, without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. But look at this verse. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. You pray 
and you're not getting anything, you're praying, you don't feel like anyone is listening, you're praying and, and you said something, maybe you need to examine yourself here a little bit, church. Maybe you need, you need to reevaluate your heart and where you are right now. You think God would possibly want to hear a prayer? i got to tell you, if any of my children are asking for stuff with any of these things, pretty good chance I'm not going to honor that as an earthly father. Asking me with, for selfish motives? No, probably not. You've got sin in your life that is in rebellion against your father and against his word? Absolutely. No, I'm not going to give you anything. A divided heart, a hard heart, a crowded heart, a bitter heart, an unbelieving heart? He's not listening. And it's the unbelieving heart that leads to these last two. Number nine is no love for Christ. He says, if you love me, then keep my commandments. Don't profess your love for him and ignore his scripture. Don't, with your, with the outward expression of your mouth, say, yeah, I believe God, I love God, with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you ignore his word. And you forsake his word and you rebel against his word. There's no love for Christ in you. Therefore, you could not pray for anyone else. There's no true love for others without a true love for Christ. Number 10 is no regeneration. Regeneration is the word that we use for people that have not been born again. We lost. God does not hear the prayer of the lost except for one. God save me. The only prayer that he hears in the lost person is the repentant prayer of God save me. In Psalm 34, it says, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to blot out their name from the earth. Who does he listen to? The righteous cry out. And the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the broken brother and saves those who are crushed in spirit. So how about you, church? God listening to your prayers? Are you that guy in James 5, the prayer of the righteous man, the effective prayer of the righteous man has great power and accomplishes much? As we conclude our series in loving one another and serving one another and bearing with one another's burdens, do you know how to intercede for someone? Do you know how to pray, really pray for one another? To pray without ceasing. To pray at all times. To pray with no stumbling blocks, without any hindrances. To communicate with your God, your Creator, your Savior, your Lord. And to be in constant fellowship with Him. Listening at times. Speaking at times. Like so many other ways, we're tempted just to kind of let that part slide. Be honest with yourself today. Be honest with yourself. Are you a prayer? God hear your voice? You know what his voice sounds like? Is this just something that you're a good Christian's kind of supposed to do when you get the chance? Or is this a part of your life? 